If you were a thrusting young executive in the 1970s, this is the car that you would have aspired to. Okay, well now we're at Crew Heritage Centre and I've got a classic car meeting, so whereas normally it's Railway Arna, that's the focus of the exhibit here today, it's road transport and hopefully there'll be a few classic cars and other vehicles here to have a bit of an ogle at. A lovely old Routemaster bus. It's a bit of a damp, soggy day unfortunately, but we've got an MGB Roadster here, it's venturing out into the rain. The roof is up though, unsurprisingly. We always get a turnout of Americana here. Next to this, we've got a fantastic Ford Cortina Mark III. This is a 2000 GXL. This was very much top of the tree back in the day. This is a four-door version. But, yeah, if you were a thrusting young executive in the 1970s, this is the car that you would have aspired to. It's such a rare survivor now. <laughs> Fortunately, the owner's not afraid of a, a little bit of rain. That's great. A spot of rain won't do it too much harm. Very distinctive 1970s colour. You've got the vinyl roof as well, the roof-mounted roof aerial. Alongside that, we've got a fantastic old Chevy uh, pickup truck of the late 1960s. Bigger wheels, looks like it's slightly modified, bit of a bit of a grungy, oily rag look going on there. And you're not seeing things, this is actually a Vauxhall PA Velox. Somewhat modified now, but it started out life as a PA Velox. Not quite sure what mods this one's had, but Looks like there are plenty of them. Side pipes. The rear lights look like a Cadillac. They look very similar to sort of the 59 Caddy back end. Got a mini off. Very much an early 70s classic now, we've got a Triumph 2000. You can either have the 2.5 or the 2 litre, this is a 2000 with a straight 6 engine under the bonnet. Great cars, this is the Mark II version. They came out, the Mark I in about 1964 or 65, somewhere like that. And continued and through until the fairly late 1970s. This is on a K plate, so the K registration series ran from August 1972 to July 1973. So this car falls somewhere within that age range. And next to that, we've got a very much more modern Rover ST1, the V-Reg, about 1979. This is a V8 car, you could get the 2 litre or 2.3, 2.6, the 3.5 litre V8. And that's what we've got here. Don't see too many of these now. Those wheels are off the, I think they're off the VDP version, but someone will correct me, I'm sure. But this is a fairly early SD1. Very modern design for its era. Spot of Roots Group now from the late 1960s. This is a fastback Sunbeam Rapier. Most previous rapiers have been based on the old uh, Ordax series Hillman Minx. This is a clean sheet of paper, more aligned to the Hillman Minx and the Hunter. Very few and far between now seeing these. Next to that, we've got a much more ubiquitous MGB GT. This is on chrome bumpers, but originally it's an R red, so it would have been on the rubber bumpers originally. A very nicely turned out car, and on a day like this, bright yellow car really stands out. got a classic Mini here. Various modifications, not quite sure what's hiding under the bonnet. Is it a standard 998 or is it a 1275 or something even fruitier? I don't know. And then here we've got a Fiat 600. This is sort of the bigger brother to the Fiat 500. 
This is a 1964 car. Another classic Mini. Love little Wolseley Hornet there on period style Mini like type wheels. That's a really immaculate example. You can see how the design was based on the old mini body shell but just extended at the back there. An old freight liner, the big old diesel here. Another MGB Roadster chrome bumper car, but again it started out life with rubber bumpers. There's always a good turnout of MGBs at any classic car show and this place is no exception. It's just great that plenty of cars have turned up when the weather report was looking far from promising. A car that won't be worrying too much about the weather is the Reliance Scimitar here, the SE5. This is N registration to early 1970s. Um, and rain causes no real headaches for the owner of this particular car because the body is fiberglass. There's a steel chassis hidden away underneath, but the car, the body itself, is all fiberglass, so no rot to worry about there. And this one's really nice. Really practical, sort of halfway house almost in this state, really. Loads of storage space in there. Interesting, even though it is a fiberglass car, there's a sticker on the back window saying it has had the Zybart rust proofing protection. That was probably for the chassis. It's such a practical car, that is. Always V6 Ford powered, of course, they have the V6 engine under the bonnet. Well, here's another rare old beast at first glance, you think it's another Triumph 2000 Mark II, but this is the 2.5 litre fuel injected version, the PI. This had the same fuel injection system as on the Triumph TR6, a Lucas system, which back in the day wasn't renowned for reliability, but um, I think most people have probably sorted them by now, they've had 40 odd years to correct any little gremlins that were in the Lucas system. But surviving examples of the big Triumph saloons on fuel injection still are fairly few and far between now. You had the 2500S, which had twin carburetors, and that was probably a lot easier to look after than the fuel injected car, and that probably still applies even today. But it's great to see one that's still on its original fuel injection system. This wonderful old oily rag has been on the channel before. Looks like the old Bill's in town. Anyone who remembers the Fall Guy TV series in the 1980s will probably recognise this as a GMC of the late 1970s. This is a replica of the pickup truck that featured in that particular TV series. Alongside that, we've got this somewhat modified Ford F1. This appeared in the video that I did earlier this year at Capestone Hall, a classic car show. If you've not seen that yet, please check that out after watching this one, of course. The big Chevy, very wide rear end on this one. A 1970s Chevy Silverado pickup. <laughs> I 
this fantastic old station wagon to Plymouth Satellite, 1970. There's that slightly modified PA Velox firing up. I suspect that engine didn't come out of uh, Luton. Chrysler 300C and a Ford pickup truck, oh, 1970s. This is let's have a look. This is an F250 Ranger XLT. <laughs> There's a hefty old Cadillac, J Reg, what's that, about 1970 or thereabouts? Huge two door coupe, I suppose. That colour certainly pops in this gloomy weather that we're enjoying today in Sunny Crew. There goes that Velox, I don't know if you can hear it. Well, we're inside one of the main exhibition halls now at Crew Heritage. Before we have a look at the cars, let's just have a look at this. I'm not even sure what this is, but if you can tell me what this particular locomotive is, uh, please do so. It looks like it's the kind of thing that would have hauled freight back in the day. So I can say if you can add any comments and background history on this particular machine, please do so. And the same with the cars, if you can shed light on more background info on any of the cars feature, please please pop a note in and just let me know what you think of the cars that are actually featured in this particular video. Over here, we've got a wartime era Jeep. Let's have a look. This is a Willis. The Ford and Willis produced these back in the war. Uh, Willis MB truck, quarter ton 4x4 Jeep. Bit of information there, so I'll just zoom in on that for you. Very smart indeed. The question with an E-Type is, would you go for the fixed head, the coupe, or the roadster? I think I would probably, if I could fit in it, I would go for the coupe. I just think the styling is particularly beautiful. That roof line is just something else. Um, the roadster may be a little bit nicer to drive around in, being open top. But in terms of styling, I think the coupe has it. Let me know in the comments what you think. Quick peek under the bonnet. Triple carburetors, XK engine of course, like I say 4.2 litre. The later XJs were 4.2 litre as well, but there were differences between the engines, even though the capacities were pretty much the same. Beautiful, beautiful car. Now I do like the look of these, I did try and buy one of these. I went to look at one in a barn a couple of years ago but the seller was just holding out for a bit too much money and they ended up selling it at auction for more or less what I offered him, but such is life. This is 1965 Jensen CV8, the big Chrysler V8 under the bonnet there, all fiberglass body. And unlike many cars which are fiberglass bodied, this was produced to a very high standard. The, the thickness of the fiberglass in some parts, especially on the bonnet underneath, it's almost like half an inch thick in places. It's really, really heavy duty. The doors on the CV8 are aluminium, but the door, the, the main body itself is fiberglass. Very much a two plus two. You got a couple of seats in the back, and obviously a couple of seats in the front. But well, these were very much a gentleman's sort of GT Express of the 1960s at the time. These were the fastest four seaters available in this country, I believe. The crack 140 miles, uh, genuine 140 miles an hour. Very much a, a gentleman's carriage. A little bit on the thirsty side, if what I've read is correct. But I guess with a whatever it is, six or whatever litre engine, cries the V8 under the bonnet, it's not going to be particularly frugal. But you don't buy a car like that to worry about frugality. Next to CV8 we've got the good old Morris Miner, this immaculate example I've seen at shows before. And this is just, it must be as new 
all the wood looks new on the back. This was structural, whereas on the mini estates, the countrymen um, that had the wood on the side, that was purely cosmetic. This is all very structural. So if this rots, then you've got real problems and the back end basically falls off. But this looks like it's all been done, all re fully refurbished throughout. And there's a, a glorious example of the breed. I do like the maroon as well. Next up, a little Triumph Spitfire 1500. My, the first car that I ever pieced back together was an earlier Mark III Triumph Spitfire. That was in the 1980s. This is one of the late 1500cc versions. Same basic engine, just bored out slightly. Uh, and that engine, the 1500 engine, which it shared with the rubber bumper MG Midget, that can be traced back to the standard 8 of the early 1950s. Back then it was 803cc, and then it was enlarged to 948 for the standard 10, and later the Herald. Then it was 1147cc and then 1296cc and that engine went into the Mark III onwards Spitfires and the Herald 1360 and then it was enlarged to just under 1500cc and that's the engine that powers this particular Spitfire and this is a very nice car indeed. Is this Inca yellow? I might be wrong. They're a very, very neat little sports car. You can buy everything for them and if as a first classic car, something like a Spitfire is actually quite a practical choice. You lift that front hinge bonnet up, you, that hinges up that way, and you can get at everything, the front suspension, all the engine, down the sides of the engine, etc. The accessibility is second to none, really. They've also got a really good turning circle, so if it's a bit tight pulling into your garage, um, something like this would probably be a pretty good choice. I certainly, I certainly really like them. Next up, a pretty early example of the Lotus Cortina Mark I. This is the so-called pre-airflow car. You can tell the grille is slightly different and the side lights are slightly different on the early cars compared to the later ones. Lotus Twin Cam Power, of course, made famous by drivers like Jim Clark back in the day for their many, many touring car racing successes. And as a result, they're very sought after today. Whitby Morrison, the ice cream uh, van makers, uh, they're, they're local to crew and this is part of their collection which is on display here. Um, you've got the Batman Mini, this is based on a mini pickup. So this is like a fiberglass body up here. But the main body, that is the original BMC or BL mini pickup body to which all this has been added. That's just a great fun little car that is. There's another variety on a similar theme next to it, Jane's Dairy Ice Cream. Again, mini pickup based. And alongside that, we've got a Ford Anglia Ice Cream run from 1965. This is actually based on the Thames 307E, which was the van version of the, well, they did the van and the pickup version of the Anglia 105E saloon. So again, you've got the factory lower body, doors around the screen, etc. And then they've added on this fiberglass body with all the ice cream gear and fridges and stuff in the back. That's fantastic. And we've got slightly larger. This is a Bedford CF based ice cream van. I have got a video of photographs featuring just ice cream vans and re food retail vehicles. So if you've not seen that, please check it out. And I think a number of these vehicles are here actually featuring that as well. So this is a CF, the Mark I Bedford CF that this particular van's based on. And this is a CF2, which is the sort of the revised version. Wonderful old uh, Delta Integrale, Lancia Delta Integrale. Is this the one that Car SOS did it? Looks like it could well be. I remember that episode. Super successful rally cars back in the day. This is giving me ideas of things to do with a little grey Anglia, perhaps. Only joking. But many Pops and Anglias did get converted into hot rods. Some more successful than others. This one seems to have been done very well. But many, many people buy old Pops and Anglias, take them apart, try and fit a Viva front axle or a Jag back axle on the back and then give up when they run out of talent or money or both. But when the job gets finished, fair dues. A 
a Vauxhall Viva HC here. This appears at many of the local classic car shows. Really smart example, and again, it's one of those cars that they used to be everywhere at one time, but they've all but disappeared now. So to see a very clean survive like this, it's great. This is a two-door car, L-Reg, so what's that, 1973 to 1974, that particular series ran from. And these things, like most cars in the 1970s, rotted for England, so it didn't help their chances of survival one little bit. So how the few that do survive actually did so is quite a surprise, really. Well, I think we've probably seen most of the cars that are going to turn up at this particular car meeting. Uh, by its nature, it's mainly railway related relics that survive here. So I can have just a quick walk down here and just see what we can spot. Just the one two five. An old freight liner, the big old diesel here. There's always something being worked on in the workshops here. Well, I think we've probably seen all the old cars that are going to be turning up at this particular meeting. So I think we'll head off home. So, thanks very much for watching. Please check out some of the other vintage and classic car videos that are now on the channel. More videos along very, very soon. Bye for now.